If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Elwyn Paul is an education specialist with a passion for learning. He's been instrumental in setting up charter schools, has a real passion for breaking through with kids with learning difficulties. And we're going to have a chat about the state of education in New Zealand. Elwyn is on the line now. Welcome to The Crunch. Uh, Thanks, Cameron. And I I, I won't call you whale as uh, John Banks did last week because, you know, I I feel there's (laughs) something derogatory in that. Oh, no. Banksy and I have known each other for (laughs) 40 odd years. So, yeah, he calls me whale. That's just a term of endearment from the old whale oil days, but that's okay. Now, you were instrumental or, or involved deeply in charter schools uh, when mm-hmm. they existed. Uh, you've got a passion for education. What sort of marks would you give this government since it was formed in October on education? And and let's talk about Erica Stanford as well as the as the minister in charge. Yeah. Um, if we can bump it back just uh, a, a term, and I, and I think I saw an uh, uh, interview that included Erica Stanford and Willie Jackson on the weekend. Yeah. And Erica presented really well about the amount of work they need to do. And Willie said, well, you know, Erica has got a big job, but so did Jan Tanetti. And what Labor has been at pains to do is point out uh, that Jan Tanetti was the uh, Minister of Education, when the truth is that for more Christopher than Chris Hipkins was years, the Minister, wasn't he? Chris Hipkins was the Minister of Education. Mm. And uh, arguably, well, arguably, uh, I'd say statistically, uh, the worst Minister of Education we have seen. Uh, he did nothing. His only legacy was throwing out national standards without any sort of uh, replacement and uh, saying and, and throwing out the charter school model, him, Ardun, and others promising that significant work would be done on the designated character school model. They didn't do any of it. Um, they had applications during their term from people like, well, I, I'd call, think Nathan and Yvette Jury are New Zealand's best educators. Um, people like Nathan and Yvette, myself, Francis Valentine, and others to set up really high-quality designated character schools. Mm. The ministry, no doubt, from the minister, uh, said no to all of them uh, and then justified why. So Eric has come in and National have come in on on the basis of a real disaster. Uh, Last year, certainly the education sector didn't help themselves. Uh, we had on top of the sort of COVID response that was still uh, impacting, we had this proliferation of teacher-only days uh, yeah. and almost all of them taken either before or after a weekend or after a holiday or after a long holiday, long weekend. Yeah. Um, we had uh, strike days and not only strike days, but a significant number of paid union meetings. We've got this uh, situation, and and unfortunately, one of the charter schools that I'm not involved with these schools now, but one of the charter schools I set up, uh, first of all, went on strike, and I just about fell out of my tree. They then started taking teacher-only days, and I've always said you you simply cannot put kids from Decile 1 families, Decile 1, 2, 3 even, on the street because these teachers have got 12 weeks holidays a year. They've got callback days in their contract, which schools don't use. The good parents in that situation will take a day's leave to look after their kids, or they'll pay. And they only have four weeks leave a year, if that. And so that's pretty bad. And then we've got, um, and again, I I saw one of those schools, but plenty of other schools having their uh, parent interviews in the day during the day and sending kids home. And, and and so you've got this crazy situation where we've got uh, 38% of Māori and Pacifica kids attending full-time. That's, uh, 10, that's atrocious. Kids, it's atrocious. 10,000 kids in the wind. Uh, in other words, no one knows where they are. 
everyone knows there's an attendance crisis, and yet schools are behaving or behaved that way last year. And um, Stanford was really critical, and I think rightly so, of Tanetti, uh, who was minister at the time, for not getting the Term 3 2024-23 attendance stats out mm. uh, before the election. The Term 4 ones are not coming out until April as well. Well, that was something to, to kick off with. So how, are they, how have they done so far? I felt that the key thing to show from the moment they got elected was genuine public-facing leadership. Yeah. Uh, and, and whether that's uh, Erica Stanford or David Seymour as the uh, associate minister, I felt that from November, December, through January into February, that they would be absolutely banging on about school attendance. And, you know, every every press release, every chance they got to speak, uh, schools do a better job, contact your parents, involve the families, families get your kids to school. And we heard nothing of it until I think well into February where Luxon and Stanford went to Browns Bay Primary. Yeah. Uh, hardly the heart of problematic education. And uh, mentioned it there and, and Luxon said, you know, families across New Zealand have got to be responsible for getting their kids uh, into school. And then this morning, uh, Luxon said that, well, Seymour is in charge of that policy and there'll be announcements coming out soon. Mm. Well, it's April and the announcement sounds at the moment, and, and let's wait and see a little bit, like they will be in and around punishing parents as opposed to necessarily improving school quality. And and that's I'm not, I'm not sure how that's going to work. The banning of cell phones in, in principle sounds like a good idea. I, they messed up the announcement of that to me because there are a lot of kids who have needs different ways of learning who have depended on their cell phones for doing things like taking photos of notes off the board. You've got kids with significant anxiety trying to get back into school and, and being able to contact a parent you know, at breaks and lunch times is a big part of their... But how's this come to... I mean, you hear this anxiety thing a lot. Yeah. It almost seems like a crutch or an excuse for any sort of behaviour. I know that they have high anxiety. And so they're having a day off school here because, you know, mental health day. And yeah. I, I, can't, I can't count the number of parents that I've heard say, oh, no, Sebastian or um, Matilda is having a day off. Um, for their mental health. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, when I was a kid, even if I had a drippy nose, mum was booting me out the door and saying, go to school. I had to be pretty damn sick for me to get a day off school. Yeah. Um, there's there's a mix. I mean, I is obviously going back a little bit, but uh, in my what was Form 2, uh, I... Uh, I don't know, uh, had a, you would probably call it a, a depression. And, mm. uh, you know, and for the first term, I, you know, my parents did, I, I don't know whether I told them or not, but I I, I faked an illness yeah, uh, fairly successfully, managed to get myself in hospital twice. Um, You're pretty and, good and, at it then, weren't you? I know, I was. Yeah, it wasn't until uh, the psychologist at Waikato uh, Hospital sort of um, caught me out one day not coughing and uh, we had a chat and he was great. Yeah. And um, but so I, I think, I mean, I think that was a genuine anxiety. And uh, it probably wasn't until uh, my mid 40s that. Because uh, I carried that anxiety, I still do, but I carried that anxiety and, and sort of white knuckled it for a long time. So there will be a core of kids for whom that's a part of their makeup. And how you deal with that requires a heck of a lot of skilled parenting. Um, we've had in the in the schools that that I've operated, we've had kids who you would call genuinely school averse. You know they. Mm. Um, um, and and but I, I think you're right. I, 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 the projected problem is bigger than the actual problem. Um, it's an interesting term you use, the projected problem, because I can remember when my my kids were younger and at intermediate school, and we got called up 
to uh, go see the school and they decided that they had a label that they wanted to apply to my son. Yep. And the crux of it was uh, not that they wanted to do anything, but they wanted additional funding. And so we needed to right. label somebody so they could then apply to the ministry to get teacher aids. And I said to them, well, the problem you've got at your school is that you've decided to bus in a whole lot of decile one kids from down south mm -hmm. into a decile 10 area so that you could jimmy the system to get more money that way. And as a result, these kids are bigger physically, right, right than, than, uh, than European kids or Chinese kids. And it was a prevalence of Chinese and Europeans in the school, but, but a large cohort of Pacifica and, and Maori children from down south. And they're bigger. And you use the term bullying, but, you know, I, I'm a realist in, in life and there is a pecking order. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you see it in chickens, you see it in any type of animal and humans are animals. And so you see it again in schools, you call it bullying, but it's not really. And so um, you've got a problem there, but you want to solve the problem by labeling the kids that are being, that are different yep. with a label and then stick a teacher aid with them and then exacerbate the bullying because now they're a special kid. Yeah. And kids are cruel. They just yeah. are. Right. And they, they, it, dep it depends what's modeled to them. I like a lot of what you're saying. We, we had a boy at Mount Hobson uh, who had Tourette's. Now, it was the first child I'd taught with Tourette's. And uh, a couple of things uh, came of it. Neat kid and at times distraught by his mm. situation. Mm. Uh, he didn't often swear, but there, there was one situation where a kid came sprinting down the drive. I had a whole lot of parents in the office. Kid came sprinting down the drive and said, uh, let's call him Brian. Brian just called me a mother. Yeah. And I went, what? Shush. <laughs> well, he called me a, and he repeated it yeah. uh, two or three times. And I said, look, he, he didn't. Yes, he did. He called me a mother. Yeah. And I went, I went, no, no, no. You know how he has ticks? Well, yes, but he never swears. Well, I said, this time he did. Yeah. I can guarantee it. And he wasn't calling you it. And he goes, well, I'm still telling my parents. And I said, that's okay. You can tell your parents, but don't use the term. Um, but one of the things with this kid is he would greet people and he would say, hi, you know, I, I'm Brian and I've got Tourette's. Yeah. And I'd say, no, 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 <laughs> no. Yeah. Hi, I'm Brian. Pleased to meet hi, you. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm a cool guy. Yeah. And, and, and let's, let's. You know, it's a really simple way of saying whether it's ADHD, whether it's dyslexia, anxiety, dyslexia. You know, all of those things, they can't define you. And with something like dyslexia, ultimately, for that child to be successful, they have to work harder. Yeah, now, oh, yeah. They have now, to learn, they've got different learning styles. I mean, yeah. this is the, the bugbear I've always had with schools, going back to my experience. You know, now we're going to talk about schools and rankings a little bit later on, you mm. know, in, in the interview. But I went to Auckland Grammar and they streamed people and yes. they still stream people. And I was uh, came home from school on, after the first day of exams and, um, and, and told that I was in 3C, so mm -hmm. ABC, 30 kids in each class, or more like 35 in each class, I think it was back then, all squeezed in. And um, you know, Dad thought I should have been in 3A. And mm -hmm. um, so he went up and talked to the headmaster. We didn't have principals back then. It was a headmaster. It was I John think it Graham. still is there. Yeah, it was John Graham. Yep. Lived across the road from the school. And he said, um, no, the exams are right. That's where your, your, where your boy uh, belongs. If he wants to be in 3A or 3B, well, he needs to, you know, take the first term, sit the exams at the end of the first term and uh, do better. And, of course, um, I was in that class where – Everybody in that class knew that we could be in 3A or 3B, but we couldn't be bothered doing the work. So we were a teacher's nightmare. <laughs> and I was like, like that all the way through school. Yeah. And, you know, I remember in the third form, uh, the parent teacher evenings, like you touched, they were in the evening, right? Yes. And yeah. mum, mum went up to, to the school and the, the form teacher said, oh, your son's very difficult to teach. And she said, oh, really? Why is that? She said, oh, well, it's like he reads encyclopedias. And uh, my mother said, well, he does. <laughs> he comes home from school and grabs a, a, you know, a piece of cake or a cookie or 
you know, a glass of water, and sits down, and he'll pick a world book or an Encyclopedia Britannica, whatever takes his fancy, and he'll read it from cover to cover, and he won't put it down till five o'clock. So yeah, he does. Yeah. But but the impression that I got from schooling and then bringing my own kids up through the schooling system is that they love bell shaped curves. And of course, reality doesn't like that. No, exactly. And um, you know, they don't cater for people at either end of the bell shaped curve. And yeah. the, the the challenges of teaching a super bright person as opposed to a, a what well, you know I was facetious, facetiously called dullards, but you know they're the same. They're the same challenges. You've got to keep them interested. Yeah, I, in education. I, I I work a bit, uh, keep up correspondence with John Hattie, who is arguably you know the world's best meta researcher for education. Mm. And and the nature of our conversation in brief is John to say, well, this is what the data says, and me to say, and it's my job to change it. Mm. And with that kind of bell-shaped curve, the teaching learning philosophy that I go with is that, and it it's it's got a lot behind it, but every student can develop exceptional learning skills absolutely in, in knowledge sets with expert teaching coaching mentorship, uh, significant purposeful practice mm. and opportunities to express themselves. And there's, there's very little in cognitive science, et cetera, to say that uh, the bell-shaped curve should exist. And a lot of that, as you say, is schools delight in it because it gives them an excuse. I, I went to, and, and I'll come back to National in a sec, but I, I went down to a school a few years ago to check that what I was teaching and writing for curriculum for the schools I was involved in was good for year 10 science. Mm. So I went and I saw a head of department at a school that uh, at that stage I had uh, respect for. And I said, what do you do for year 10 science? What do you do to really you know, get these kids fired up and interested? And he said, oh, Alan, you've got to understand, it's, it's a big school. And I went, yeah. And he went, well, we all we want to do in year 10 is find out who can from who can't. And, and unbelievable. Just, oh, but that that is incredibly common. Um, Mount Hobson, we we got a lot of kids who had a background that was not conducive uh in terms of heading towards really good academic results. Mm. We taught them all as if they could. Uh, we probably failed over 18 years on on maybe I don't know five occasions, mm. which is which is not bad, but still I I don't like the five. 97 percent of those kids got at least level one NCA and and well into the 70s I think went on to university entrance and things like that. Um, we had advantages in that we were small. We were you know by definition I guess we had most of the parents were supportive, but we scholarshiped a lot of kids in who couldn't afford it. And that, to me, that's the approach that we need in our schools, not a bell-shaped curve. So I, I guess the feedback that they're getting from the cell phone ban is 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 mostly positive. I, I don't think it's working for the kids who are not going to school, and I think it needed to be accompanied by a, a really good program working with parents because those kids, are, the school's only got those kids for five or six hours. Yeah. So are they going home and binging on their phones from there? Uh, are parents aware that no kid should be behind a closed door with an internet uh, capable device mm. uh, because they'll see things that they can't unsee? How are parents doing with having the phones on top of the fridge at, say, eight o'clock at night? Are they having phone free dinners so they can, you know, all of those sorts of things that. See, I, see what you and I were brought up when there were no cell phones. I, 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 I've only got one for very rare occasions now. Yeah. I mean, I, the first time I had, a, I had a cell phone that I bought myself that wasn't related to work, mm -hmm. I was 30 years old. Right. Right. So up until then, I seemed to have managed to get through life without cell phones. I certainly got through school without cell phones. Yes. And I can remember at school, you know, there was a great fuss about calculator watches and stuff like that. And, oh, dude, it's terrible. You could cheat and all of that sort of thing. Well, you know, the smartest amongst us, we had devised methods of cheating that teachers hadn't even thought of, mm -hmm. um, you know, because 
we didn't like to do an awful lot of work. We went to school to eat our lunch in many respects because school wasn't a challenge. And, and you know, I remember in the seventh form, I remember my English teacher who said that he wrote on my first exam in the seventh form. I got he he'd given me seventy five percent, but I looked at the paper and I'd actually got ninety five percent. The teacher was annoyed with me because I didn't do any classwork, and I didn't hand in any any essays or or things like that. And so the guy who got second in the class had got seventy eight percent. And so he scaled me down to 75%. So I'd come second to the guy who got 78. And he wrote on my report, a splendid exam result achieved with little obvious effort. And, well, the, and he handed, it to, handed me my report and grinned at me and said, we'll see what your parents say about that. Yeah. And I just laughed like hell. I said, thank you so much for the compliment, sir. His name was Graham Marshall. He went on to become the principal of Hutt Valley High School. Right. Um, yeah. And I remember it to this day, you know, and then yeah. – then what I worked out is all I had to do was hand in about 50% of the essays and, and homework and stuff like that, and I'd still pass and I wouldn't get scaled back and I'd get it. So I ended up walking, you know, first time in my entire secondary school life, walking across the stage and shaking John Graham's hand, getting an award for a prize for English, um, only because I played to the, the strengths of the petulant teacher. I could, I, my boys went to grammar and in lots of other experiences. I could write a book on it and, um, oh, so could I. Uh, only, 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 only one very short chapter would be positive. And, uh, you know, Tim O'Connor went on with Bruce Cottrell the other day and said B. Plus. Mm. And, uh, Tim O'Connor's the headmaster there and, you know, boasted that they had an 86% UE pass rate for leavers. Well, their statistic is 74%. And I knew I wouldn't get a reply from Tim, but I did write to him and point it out. And you know, it's 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 I I don't regard it as a good school. Uh, I I think the students there come from uh, good families who who pretty much push their kids along, and a lot of the kids become motivated by competition. But I I asked my boys how many good teachers did you have at grammar, and they sort of stared at me, and then they sat down and talked to each other and counted and came back with five. Oh, over, that, that over, over 10 combined years. Yeah, I think um, mine, mine would be about two. Um, right. You know, I'll give you a, a good example. Uh, in the fifth form, I had uh, Rory Barrett mm -hmm. as a maths teacher. Now, he is lauded all around the country as perhaps New Zealand's best maths teacher. And let me tell you how Rory Barrett taught our class. He was <laughs> never in the class. Yeah. He would get a prefect to come in and write on the board, you have to read pages twenty nine to thirty of the of the te of this textbook. You know, it might be calculus or whatever, and answer the questions on page forty one. And we'd never see him. That's I, I, how he took, taught maths at Auckland Grammar School. It took me a while with some kids. I taught. Uh, I'd say, well, how did how did, you, how did you get this one right? And they go, oh, Bob helped. Took me a long time. I mean, I must be a bit of a bit of a, a, a social dummy. But after a month, I, I finally said, well, who's Bob? A oh, back of books, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a back of book. And yeah. I was like, ah, oh, dear. Um, so in terms of, you know, the cell phone thing, dis decreasing distractions in class, you know, it, it, that can't be a bad thing. Um, a lot I of was the worst student. Like, you yeah. know, distractions in class, I was the distraction. Yeah. You know, I oh, can so remember was I can remember one teacher at Grammar, Paul Forder was his name, an economics teacher. I actually quite liked the guy. He'd be writing on the board, scratching away, and he'd say, Slater, if I hear your voice one more time, I'm going to cane you. And then I'd pipe up from the back of the class, sir, if you tried to cane me, I'd laugh in your face. <laughs> so, so it kind of backfired every time. Yeah, that's. I think that's why, uh, you know, I found myself being a, a, a pretty good classroom teacher mm. because I, I'd done everything. And, yeah. and 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 I'd learn to laugh with kids as opposed to at them, and if they if they manage to really get one over me to laugh at that too. Uh, I, I always felt and, that teachers were, well, the teachers that I had were intent on humiliating students. Yeah, and felt. Well, I actually think that a lot of my teachers were bullies. Uh, I, yeah, I look, I. I uh, I agree. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, I I went, I I talked with Michael Laws a bit, and we both went to the same school. Him about ten years before me. It's an appalling school, uh, Wangan Wangan Boys College. I mean, at mm. the time it was appalling. We called ourselves survivors because we were one of the very few to get out of the town, and and into a university. At the moment, they have no students graduating going into universities, and they've got the UE pass rate at about one and a half percent for leavers. But I, even back then, I remember we had a swarm of earthquakes, uh, would have been 19, I don't know, 83. And these earthquakes would come through the exam hall. And while everyone was in commotion, people were just passing their papers around the hall. Mm. So, I mean, kids are in, ingenious. And the, the results went up because of the swarm of earthquakes. Um the, the 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 back to basics the three hours math uh reading and writing again in principle sounds pretty good but what would um, happen in reality I mean teachers are pretty woke and liberal and they don't really you know you never hear them going on strike when there's a labor government in but as soon as an, there's a national led government in there's all sorts of strikes and industrial actions and they um yeah. you know, go to war with the education minister. What's the reality it going to be in you know in these schools? Are they actually going to do an hour of reading, writing, and maths a day? There's there's some complications. So one one is that uh, where a number of schools already are. Mm. Uh, keep in mind the schools did strike under Hipkins and Tanetti, mm. uh, probably because they saw them as 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 pushovers. Yeah. Some schools are already that already work to that extent. There are a tremendous amount of primary school teachers who are not capable of teaching math well, um, let alone science. So, I would argue that we have a lifelong learning system called NCEA that every primary school teacher should have level two math and a level two science as well as a level two English. And once they know, once they've got that, they're far more capable of teaching it. So to me, that would be a priority. Um, as Dame Wendy Pye, who I think is a absolute New Zealand treasure that the ministry ignores mm. uh, and who produces Sunshine Books and is axial in education in places like Singapore, China, uh, does work in the Middle East and South Africa, et cetera. How are you going to get a five-year-old to write for an hour? And then, of course, in your curriculum, so a primary school's got five hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And if you were to look at that, you would say, well, you know, I, I do want them to do some some math, some reading, some uh, writing. I want them to exercise. The New Zealand history curriculum is compulsory each year. I want them to get the basics of, of science. And science is probably one of the most exciting, important subjects for kids. And there are all of these other things, and I, I think a lot of schools are just getting well. Art, you know, uh, when are we when are we going to fit all this in? And I think some of this is uh, the the literacy and the numeracy is really important. And you can't you can't do math effectively unless you can read well. People forget that too. They think reading and writing is letters and math is numbers. It isn't. You've got to be able to understand the problem to be able to do it. Mm. So we're talking about incredibly important things. And, and we're going to talk as we go on about some parenting stuff. Um, my, my children have grown up and done pretty well. Um, I'll never forget them sitting in a lounge one day and someone saying, well, how come you guys are, are pretty good at academics? And my daughter said, well, the only thing Dad did well when we were growing up, which to me is pricked up because I'd hoped there would be a, have been several, mm. but it was that I sat on the couch and read to them every night mm. from the time they were two till the time they were about 14. But it wasn't just, we, we did read. We we read Incredible books. We read classics. We 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 read Roald Dahl. We read C.S. Lewis, uh, Lord of the Rings, all, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Fenimore Cooper, and so they were steeped in literacy. And and I knew, and I don't know how. I, I, I obviously read it somewhere. I, I hardly come up with the original thought, but that you read above a child's cognitive, uh, above their skill level, into their cognitive level. It drags them up. Doesn't yeah, because they can understand story even if they can't extract mm. it themselves. Mm. And, you know, my son asked me to start reading in The Lord of the Rings before he was three. And I kind of looked at him and said, well, uh, phew, I don't know. 
I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll start reading. It took me eight months. But you have to tell me what happened the night before each time we read. Mm. And his brain could deal with it. There was no way he was going to read it, of course. And and I think, if, if again, if we're going to improve uh, literacy, et cetera, we need to go to parents and say, hey, you know what? You need to be reading to your kids. Well, and Alan Duff was talking about that, wasn't he, with you know, trying to get – yeah, trying to get books. Uh, people, there's people who've got kids in in the house, and there's not a book to be seen in the whole place. Yeah, you know, I, I had so many books when I was young. You know, we had encyclopedias. We had, we had Encyclopedia Britannica and World Book. Mum was a voracious reader. Dad was a, a a reader as well. I think I was reading James A. Mitchell in books at ten. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that sort of that sort of stuff. Um, I just go and have a look at what was on the shelf. We almost had a library, you know. Yeah. Um, if we didn't have a book there, well, mum would take us to the library. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's it's, not it's, happening it's, these days. Everyone's got huge. devices, but they're not reading, yeah. they're not understanding. Yeah, it, it would it would go a significant way to saving the numeracy and literacy situation. Uh, it would assist schools a great deal. And we put it in the two hard baskets. Um, so again, in principle, this emphasis on math, uh, particularly with what the Royal Society said under Labour, which Labour said there's great ideas and then ignored it, I think that's a big deal. We're ignoring science, and and I, I think that's because it's less measurable, particularly internationally, than the others. Well, I know um, how to get people excited in science, particularly boys. Yep. You know, if you t- teach them how to blow things up. Oh, the you know, best day the best day at Mount Holston that we we had uh, each year was to bring in uh, CO2 pastels. Oh, of course. You put them in a Coke bottle with a bit of water, put the lid on, and you've got a bomb. Unbelievable. <laughs> and and uh, oh, just superb. And one day we forgot to tell the child care centre next door <laughs> yeah. um, what, what was going on. But now you're right, kids – Absolutely adore it. We used to bring this guy called, we do a flight and space project. Yeah. And this guy called Jerry Munston in, who who built rockets, you know, model yeah. rockets. And he'd be firing off in the backyard. No idea where they landed. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 the kids well, we, just did, we, you know, we, we used to learn about science on Guy Fawkes Day, didn't we? Uh, absolutely. You know, if you hold on to this, it'll hurt your fingers. <laughs> I, what, what Experiential old... learning. The old, um, uh, well, it, it was my friends who blew up letterboxes, but, you know, the old double happy in the, in the top of a um, can. Or a trifle. In a pot, in a pot of water. And uh, you'd send this can 30 feet into the air. So so there's there's a lot that can be done, and I think science is neglected. And you go back to reading, um, I always say to families, one of the books you must have in your home is the illustrated version of Bill Bryson's The Short History of Nearly Everything, because a kid will read that and they're hooked. Well, what we did with with, with our son is we got him um, horrible histories. Right, yep. You know, and, and he just read those voraciously, you know, yeah. and, and the, they were, it was a, a lighthearted, you know, look at, you know, a vicious Vikings and they had all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it was targeted specifically at boys. Yeah. Um, and and as a consequence, he's got a, a good working general knowledge uh, and yeah, understanding absolutely. of history. And and there's so much more you can learn. I, I, I thought I knew a little bit about um, some of the aspects of the bomb development at the end of World War II. I'm currently watching Oppenheimer on Netflix. You know, oh, it's sort of amazing, 20, isn't it? 20 minutes a night. I'm, I'm stunned. Stunned by just about everything, including the acting. I, and I, I um, love the bit where he, I love the bit where he says to Einstein, "Here, yeah, I want you to have a look at this. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> at this equation, because the equa- they they couldn't work it out. You know, the the, yeah. the generals were saying, well, what, what are your what are your scientists saying about the equation? You know, what happens if we set one off in the atmosphere and said, well, we could burn the Earth to to a crisp? Could set off a change reaction. So what did Einstein say? Einstein said, well, the only way you're going to find out is to let one off." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's it's it's, it's, it's it's classic boys' own stuff, isn't it? Oh, we don't know how big this is going to be. Uh, we, maybe we'll stand back a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 stunning, and kids respond. 
when we set up South Auckland Middle School and Middle School is talking about those charter schools, you know, one of our projects at the beginning of year 10, uh, the second project is Shakespeare. And people sort of look at you and go, what? And um, they love it. And and when that globe, you know, the pop-up globe was on yep. in Auckland. Yeah. Um, so, so they are talking of bringing back charter schools. Uh, again, there's a lot of people in society who are interested. I've got at least six groups who want to work with me. Yeah. Uh, I've got uh, two opportunities already in terms of buildings, et cetera. It, it's going to be incredibly important that they establish this model in a way that, that it can't be undone. That it can't be undone. Um, David's talking about state schools being able to transfer. That's cool. Um, I think small private schools should have the same opportunity. Mm. Um, he says the bigger private schools will cost the government too much money. If they did, I don't think they would anyway because they wouldn't get the funding that they need to to maintain the the schools like Kings and St. Cuths. Yep. Um, the key, key element, or two of them uh, combined, is that the ministry have nothing to do with the approval and monitoring, uh, that it's established as a separate entity. And the second one is that the approval has nothing to do with the current network. So if we go back to Wanganui Boys College, uh, education in Wanganui uh, is appalling. Uh, both Wanganui High School and Wanganui City College, Wanganui Girls, Colour Lane, they're all very low performers. Collegiate's okay, but most of the kids come from elsewhere anyway. But if I went to Wanganui and said, look, I'd, I'd like to set up a charter school down here and try and improve things, at the moment I'd be told by the ministry no, because there are 500 empty desks at Wanganui City College. Yeah, Ooh. but they're all out on the street setting fire to letterboxes and, you know, doing ram raids and all that sort of stuff because they're not at school. Correct. So that's one of the big problems. If the ministry have got a hand in this, uh, it will not succeed in the way that it should. So, so that's 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 um, another policy they have in place. Clearly, the school lunches is up for debate. I, I was meeting with someone this morning, and, and they said, "What what was done about attendance?" And I said, "Well, they had a select committee meeting uh, investigation of two thousand six hundred schools." Eight schools submitted. So how seriously are schools taking attendance? In the report that came out, it said there's no evidence to associate school lunches with improved, what do you call it, uh, attendance. And then your friend Boyd Swinburne, I mean, he, he was all over TV1 last week saying how the data showed that attendance had improved, and get this, by an average of three days a year, so that's 0 0.075 days a week for $324 million spending. But this, see, that, this is bollocks, right? And it sounds crude to say that, but it is. It's bollocks. There were no school lunches when, when I went to school. You went to school or else. Yep. And, you know, in secondary school, um, certainly, not so much in intermediate, but in secondary school it was – well, there you go. There's a fridge full of food there. You need to make your lunch before you go to school, was what mum would say. Mm -hmm. And she would supervise or oversee. She'd say, show me what you've taken to lunch for lunch. Yeah. You know, and and we did that. And then the other answer to that, of course, is, well, who fed the kids during COVID lockdowns? Or school holidays, et cetera. Who feeds the kids during school? Exactly, right? Yeah. So and, I have this strong belief that, uh, feeding your children is the responsibility of a parent. Now, I know there's a lot of parents that don't yep. uh, or won't or can't. Those are what we need to address. We need to address the don't, want, won't and can't type parents to find out what's going on. And, and if it's a money issue, well, feeding them at school isn't going to solve it. Oh, I think it has to be well-researched. Who needs it? Okay, if they need it, we'll deliver it. Yeah. But we're also going to accompany that with, with a parenting program. And people go, oh, but, you know, you, then you, you, you know, you're exposing. Well, no, we're helping people because we're bringing those people into the school. We've got good people coming in. We're talking about budgeting. We're talking about, you know, the need to do this stuff. It's not inconsequential. And the other, I, I, no, I think it's most bizarre, uh, is that let's say your school is in the school lunches program. Well, not only can you not send your lunch, 
being with your child, they kind of get penalised if they come to school with it, and often they 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 have to sit separately. And you know, our oldest kid, particularly, I mean, all three kids were really active at school, but this kid never sat still. The mm. uh, morning tea, lunch, you know, he'd get through his math so he could go out shooting hoops and playing uh, table tennis until I found out that was happening. And um, I mean, he would have had three of these lunches. And so the fact that parents can't send lunch with their kids is bizarre. And, and so they're, they're, they're reviewing that. So that's kind of what I think the government's up to. Love to see more visible leadership. There's been almost no questions in the House uh, around education. Uh, there was one last week when the Aero report came out on, on bad school behaviour. Um, to me, that again... Yes, schools have to be good and schools have to deal with what they've got and deal with it well, but that's, it's parenting. That's the problem, isn't it? Because I've got a good mate and um, his his grandson was being bullied at school and, um, you know, they'd drawn it to the attention of the school and it carried on and um, finally decided to take matters into his own hands and gave the bully a good hiding. In the yep. good old-fashioned way of dealing with bullies, right? You yep. can't do that in the modern-day society. So what happens is the parents uh, get called up to the school and said, your son's assaulted this this child. And they said, well, actually, we drew your attention to this guy's bullying and it hadn't stopped, and so he sorted it out now. And they said, oh, well, the problem is, is the guy that he hit came back and said, oh, you know, it wasn't really fair and he wanted to have another go and um, what, arranged it for after school and... Um, and uh, and your son gave him another hiding, uh, and but this time people videoed it and put it on oh, Facebook yeah. or TikTok or whatever, and so they were in trouble because it was. Now, that <laughs> my mate said, "Well, let's have a look at this video." Then said to his um, grandson, he said, "Mate, that's a sissy punch, right? You need to <laughs> need to." So what they've done is they've enrolled him in in uh, in some martial arts training so that oh. he can defend himself better. But the school suspended him for defending himself for four days. Yeah. And it was supposed to, you know, teach him a lesson. Well, he came back to the school and he's a hero because he stood up to the bully and now other people were standing up to the bully and the bullying problems ended because somebody stood yeah. up to the bully. Absolutely. And, and the one, schools one the punished best, him. One of the best phone calls I ever got, I was teaching at St. Carthus and I got a phone call from the principal of Cornwall Park District School where my three kids went, and um, it was a principal. And he said, I, I need to have a conversation about your boys, the fighting pool boys. And I said, the what? <laughs> and, he, and he said, look, uh, Michael, your older son, was was in the playground and he tripped over this b bigger boy. And the bigger boy was known for being a thumper. Mm. And so this bigger boy gets up and, and starts punching Michael. Now, Michael's brother, who was seven at the time and weighed about 25 kilograms, and had poor eyesight, I have no idea how he knew this was going on, comes tearing across the field, leaps on the bully's back and starts thumping him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the principal wanted me to talk to the boys. So, <laughs> so when they came home, I said, look, guys, you know, it's probably not a good habit to be into. But, Daniel, it's incredible, you know. Yeah. Uh, that that you went out and defended your brother because that kid weighs at least three times what you weigh and and you know I'm 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 really proud of what you did as I said I'm not going to encourage you to fight but it was a moment and um, his older brother paid him back years later they were in a in a really competitive cycle race um, and and Daniel was young and 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 Michael was riding away with the leaders and he looked around and his little brother was trying to come across the gap which was never going to happen. Mm. And so Michael dropped back, and you probably know the name Gordon McCauley, him and another were in the, were in the in the lead group, and Michael dropped all the way back to Daniel, rode him back up the front and said, never do that again. Mm. And I thought, you know, that's that came from all of that time. So, you know, we're talking about the poor behaviour in schools. Yes. We're seeing that manifest itself in society as well. Yep. We've yep. had this clamp down by schools on so-called bullying uh, you've got people using social media, you know, with impunity, saying the most awful, appalling things to kids and stuff like yep. that. They then grow up to become adults, and you see them on Twitter or X, as it's called now, saying the most appalling things to people. And I sit there and I think to myself, you know what? This is like this because these people have never had a kick in the teeth from someone they've insulted. 
They've never yeah. learned the consequences of being mean is someone gives you a hiding. I think as well. When uh, so my, my big th my big thing is at the moment parenting, and, and I I have uh, chosen not to take full time work this year. Mm. Uh, I'm earning some money the other way. So people listening, just get on my Substack and subscribe. Thanks. But we we need to address parenting in New Zealand. Uh, the the government cannot solve these problems. And schools cannot solve these problems. No. Schools have to be good. And, and I can't I'm, suspend their the way back to good behaviour. It doesn't Well, you work. can, but you'll only have 15% of the school population left. Yeah. And, and I believe we need a crown entity of parenting. Um, it needs to be incredibly well defined. But you're doing uh, something about that, aren't you? You're, you're setting up a, a, a union of parents. I'm working with some very good people to look at that because, you know, even from an education perspective, there is no parent voice. Uh, the what they call they call themselves the peak bodies, which you know, how does that work? So in Wellington, these peak bodies will meet with the minister, the ministry, PPTA, NZDI, the teacher unions, uh, principals association for secondary and primary school trustees, which so vested interests. Vested oh, yeah. interest, but nobody vesting in the interests of the children no, or the parents. No, not at all. Mm. And then you all you go all the way back. So I I, I call it Project Five Point Seven Five. I've got some good people working on this kind of thing in New Zealand, like Nathan Wallace, mm. um, who are who are saying, you know, we need to invest money in the first five point seven five years of life. That includes pregnancy. Because we've got these programs for kids in schools with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, mm. it's a heck of a lot easier to stop than to treat, and it's easy to um, prevent, isn't it? But, and we, we, you know, a lot of us have become middle class to upper class, I guess, and, and we've had role models, and and we know the things that we've talked about, like reading to your kids and stuff like that. The amount of words you speak to your kids. Mm. Hey, can I swear? Can I swear on your program? I, you just can't say the F word or the C word. The, okay, the, editors, so I, the editors throw real wobbly. Okay, so I, I was in a supermarket in Hamilton the other day. I'm not really a sweary person for the start, but and there was a parent with a kid who wasn't misbehaving, you know? Mm. He, he was two metres ahead of her and said right beside her. She's come back here, you little shit. I'm sick of your bad behaviour. And I thought, okay, if you do that in the supermarket, what's happening at home? Mm. And, and again, a, a lot of parents actually don't know the impact that that's having. And I'm trying to bring a guy called David Eagleman to New Zealand. He's, the, I'd argue, the top communicative neuroscientist in the world. And he just talks so well into those developmental years about if, if you're not producing the brain and physical development that that child needs, and that they're not going to catch up. No, and and he uses the Ceausescu uh, Romanian legacy of, of of the hundreds of thousands of orphans, and you know the people going in there after sort of a uh, period of time and saying, well, why aren't they crying? And the people in the hospital saying, well, they did, you know, for six months or two months or whatever it was per child, and then they, they stopped, stopped because no one was meeting their needs. Mm. And so really good-hearted people came in and adopted a lot of these kids, but they actually had lifelong problems. Mm. And so if we're going to address what's happening now for our 14, 15, 16-year-olds, we actually have to do that, but we need to go back and say, hey, what do we want in 18 years' time? Uh, well, that's the problem, we, isn't it? Because yep. you know everybody's got a story about a dud teacher that they had. Very oh. few people have a story about a fantastic teacher that challenged them. Yep. And we've got to turn that around. But I don't, you know, I don't know how we turn that around because my experience of teachers, you know, we talked about that with your kids, asking yep. them about, you know, Auckland Grammar. How many teachers could they name? Well, I'm in the same boat. I can only name one teacher that made a difference to my life but he made a difference to my life through sarcasm and trying to be <laughs> demeaning right yeah but but I just rose above that yeah and that's the only reason why he made a difference in my life because I actually liked his sarcasm 
And I thought, oh, well, I can work with that. There, there, there are some great teachers. I, I had one extremely influential good one who I've stayed up with. Um, our, our, our second child, he, he was pretty naughty at school, primary school. And a lot of it came back to Karen and I hadn't realised that his sight was impaired. And it wasn't until we did that he got glasses that he, you know, got. But one teacher said to us, year five, I think he's amazing. And we said, are you serious? And we weren't trying to be mean. Mm. Uh, and then it, at the end of year six, he came home and he said to us, uh, I think I'm getting a prize. Mm. And we were like, uh, okay, really? And we said, what prize do you think we're getting? He says, well, I think I'm getting best academic boy. Now, we've told him this story, so he's no longer embarrassed, but uh, we shut ourselves in a room and just, I don't know, I suppose giggled nervously. And that's exactly what happened. He, and this one teacher had turned him around. Mm. And and I, I think those stories are important because teachers, it's an amazing job. I, I still regard myself as never having worked a day in my life. And I have worked alongside some incredible teachers. Um, but then I've worked alongside, you know, the, Possibly the majority, not in the schools that I established because we had really good staff protocols, but teachers who complain about kids, mm. uh, teachers who pigeonhole kids from day one, yep. and all of those kinds of things. It, and it's a was... lasting impact on those children. You, you look at the stories I've told you. I told you a story about two teachers yep. from secondary school. I'm 55 years old and I know their names. I know what they did. Yep. I know what that and the impact that it had on me. Oh, you never forget. No. Um, and, and again, that's these people. I mean, they they spout that they are important. They are right. They are important, but they see that importance from the wrong perspective. Mm. They see it. I, I I am important. Therefore, pay me more. Well, if you're a good teacher, you deserve to be paid more. No doubt. Absolutely. No question. No, no question. Yep. But you've actually got to see yourself as being important because whether you are good or not, that child is going to remember you. They are. You know, they and, can have an impact, negative or positive, on your life. And sadly, there's far too many teachers that have a negative impact on ch children's lives, uh, yep. which have which have lasting, long-term negative consequences, which we're starting to see in society where we've got poorly behaved adults uh, interacting with other citizens in a way that we don't like. Yeah, and the school and I put that back. back Back to their lack of education and lack of understanding from the teachers as well as yeah, their parents. And, and the school school structure is important. The teachers being literate is important. I remember interviewing a, a, a teacher, and I'm not going to remember the name of the book now, but I said, "What what do you read? You know, do do you read consistently?" You know, and she said, "Oh, yeah, the last book I read. Now, what's the one about bondage and discipline?" Uh, <laughs> People will know it. Oh, the, 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 um, the Shades of Grey. Shades of Grey, yeah. Yeah. So she's sitting in my office and she said, Well, this is the last book I read. And I thought, Well, that's excellent. Next. Yeah. <laughs> Let me guess. You're the you're the resident caner and strapper of the school. Well, I think <laughs> we've just about used up all our time, Alwyn. So uh, people can find your sub stack uh, if yep. they just do a Google search for Alwyn Paul. Um, yep. Substack that will yep. pick it up and get you there, or you can use Education Plus Challenging Mediocrity. Yep, and Education Innovative Consultants. I, I mean, I said in one of your posts or post you put up yesterday, mm. you know, a lot of people will contact me because they want better for their kids. Yeah, and they start the conversation with, "Hey, look, I know you're busy, or you probably haven't got time for. You know, th this is what I live for." And and if it's a one-off conversation and I can help, that's cool. If they if they want, you know, to set up something else, some advocacy, some uh, work with their schools. I mean, I've also set up Mount Hobson Academy online. I, I I I'm no longer involved, but that is rocketing. Mm. And, and there are some really good things about virtual classrooms now, and the quality of teaching, and the communication and connectivity you have with kids all over New Zealand and some other places in the world. Uh, they get together pretty hard to punch someone in the head when you're online <laughs> uh, you know there are other ways there are other ways but these teachers are so good um there's almost no downtime and and for kids certainly who are remote it's also an amazing opportunity because yeah. a lot of our area and remote schools are just not doing well 
So, yeah, hey, thanks for your time. No and, worries, and um, you know, really appreciated you coming on the crunch. And uh, when you get, if you manage to get that uh, guy coming down uh, to visit New Zealand, we'll definitely get in touch and we'll have a chat with him as well. It, 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 people can look him up. David Eagleman, there's plenty on YouTube and stuff. Mm. He's stunning. And it, the, probably the last thing in, in terms of parenting, you know, I, I, when we were parenting our kids, we had uh, Ian Grant, you, you know, as, yep, a, I as, remember. A, yep. as a New Zealand icon in terms of the good things that you could do with your kids and, mm. and how to parent and things like that. I don't know if there's an individual like that in New Zealand now, um, but we need collectively to bring back that kind of an emphasis because the government and schools can't solve these issues. That's what Ronald Reagan used to say, um, the nine most dreaded words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Correct. The ministry have to be good. The minister has to be good. The schools have to be good. But they're only going to be a small part of the solution and they need to let it go and get parents back involved in schools, mm. back involved in parenting, and um, give them the credit that they deserve when they do well. Alan Paul, thanks for coming on The Crunch. Thanks, Cameron. Alan raises some concerning statistics, and those statistics are leading to societal impact. If kids can't or won't behave at school, or even attend, then they won't behave elsewhere. The government's made a good start, but there is much, much more to be done. Tell me your thoughts on what Elwyn Paul had to say about the state of our education system by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.